1941, on a dust-choked ridge near Solemn, Egypt, a British infantry company learned the hard lesson of modern armor the moment three panzer tanks rolled toward their position. Their anti-tank rifle team, two men hauling a 55-pound boy's rifle that promised miracles and delivered. None fired a half-inch tungsten round into the lead hull at 200 yards and watched it leave a fist-sized dent, ricochet, and do nothing. Four minutes later, the company was either dead or running. That vignette was not an exception, but the rule. From 1939 through early 1942, German armor engineering had vaulted ahead of what infantry could lug to battle. The Panzer III's 50 millimeters of frontal steel, the Panzer IV's 80, and later the Tiger I's 100 millimeters shrugged off the small, awkward anti-tank tools soldiers carried. The boy's rifle could, under laboratory-perfect conditions, pierce roughly 21 millimeters of armor at 100 yards, perfect conditions that never existed under fire. And it came with crippling costs. It weighed as much as two men's full kits, recoiled with enough force to break collarbones, and required a two-man crew and a steady, flat-on shot to have a hope of effect. The Americans were even worse off. The U.S. Infantry's stopgap anti-tank was often the 50 cal M2 Browning, a brutal, heavy machine gun excellent for half-tracks and aircraft, but against a moving Panzer IV about as useful as throwing stones. Desperate improvised measures, sticky bombs that demanded sprinting up a tank's flank and hand-attaching a charge, grenade launchers with pitiful penetration or anti-tank grenades that required closing to within 20 or 30 yards of a bristling turret, exacted predictably grim survival rates. Worse still, German doctrine by 1941 had matured into combined arms, tanks, infantry, artillery, and close air support moving in concert. A panzer division coming at your position didn't give you time to wait for friendly armor that was probably burning three miles back. Commanders in every theater, France, North Africa, and the USSR, sent the same urgent message to the ordnance departments. Give us a portable, soldier-carried weapon that actually kills tanks, or we will keep losing whole companies. The physics were blunt. Infantry were bringing 20mm solutions to an 80mm problem, and the casualty reports made the arithmetic unforgiving. Into that void walked two army officers and a jury-rigged idea in a Maryland workshop. Captain Leslie Skinner had been fiddling with handheld rocket grenades, small warheads propelled by solid motors, but the prototypes blew the thrower's hand off with backblast. Watching test firings, Lieutenant Edward Uhl asked the simple, world-changing question. What if you don't throw it? What if you launch it from a tube? It was the sort of obviousness that looks like madness at first. Skinner and his colleagues did the math and built a crude steel tube, closed at one end with a wooden plug, mounted on a shoulder stock, and fired rockets downrange. The tube didn't explode and, crucially, the operator stayed alive. Tests at Aberdeen Proving Ground in May 1942 produced wild flights. One round veered, another tumbled, but enough velocity and a surviving shooter to convince ordnance observers the concept might work. The weapon was designated the M1 rocket launcher by June 1942, and, because soldiers and reporters are quick with nicknames, it became the bazooka by July after someone remarked it looked like the pipe instrument comedian Bob Burns played on the radio. The M1 launched a 3.5-pound rocket fitted with a shaped charge warhead, a copper cone behind explosive that collapses into a superheated jet of metal, plasma able to cut steel, and in theory, could punch through more than four inches of armor. In practice, accuracy was atrocious. A smooth bore tube leaves a rocket free to yaw, tumble, or corkscrew. Tiny inconsistencies in motor thrust or wind would make points of impact scatter, and testing showed the consequence clearly. At 50 yards, the point-blank range of tank-killing, rockets might land anywhere within a 20-foot circle, 
producing hit rates too low to rely on under fire. Aberdeen tests in late 1942 were damning. Against stationary targets, hit rates under ideal conditions were marginal. Against moving tanks, they dropped below 20%. The program faced a brutal choice in December. 19 for Lautinen Rhein 1942. Abandon a promising but inaccurate weapon or fix the root cause before thousands of ineffective tubes shipped to soldiers who would trust their lives to them. Enter Henry Mohop, a Swiss-born engineer with pre-war experience in shaped charge design and data that said the problem could be solved by doing what firearms makers had done for centuries. Rifling. Rifling, cutting spiral grooves that spin a projectile as it leaves the barrel, imparts gyroscopic stability. The conventional wisdom at Aberdeen, however, was emphatic. You cannot spin a rocket while its motor is burning. You will create unpredictable forces, tear the projectile apart, or cause it to detonate prematurely. Colonel William Crozier's initial reaction was a flat no. Besides the physics argument, there was the practical one. 14,000 M1 tubes had already been manufactured at three factories. Converting every smooth bore to a rifled tube meant scrapping, recalling, and remanufacturing at enormous cost and delay. Mohop, however, brought calculations and captured weapons intelligence to the table. German adaptations of captured American launchers had already added rifling, and their accuracy metrics were measurably better. He argued that the rocket motor's brief two-second burn was actually an opportunity. If the tube imparted spin during the short acceleration phase, the projectile would maintain nose-forward orientation for the remainder of its flight. Spin wouldn't oppose thrust so much as stabilize the rocket's axis. When a direct briefing to General Gladian Barnes, Chief of Research and Development at Army Ordnance, overruled Crozier, he authorized three rifled prototypes and a decisive head-to-head -head test. January 28, 1943, at Aberdeen, was bitterly cold, and winds lashed off the Chesapeake. The test rig was mercilessly simple. Captured Panzer IV hull plates, actual enemy armor, mounted 200 yards downrange. Behind each plate, clay blocks to capture the shaped charge jet and measure penetration, and a battery of steel plates of graded thickness to set limits. Witnesses packed the observation bunker. Crozier, Barnes, Skinner, Mohop, ballistics specialists, and a stenographer. The protocol read like a courtroom cross-examination. 20 shots from standard smoothbore M1s at 50 yards, then 20 shots from Mohop's rifled prototypes under identical conditions, with three different operators for each group to remove any bias in marksmanship. The smooth bore baseline was ugly but familiar. Hits were inconsistent. Penetration hovered around four inches when the rocket hit nose first. Misses were frequent, and angular strikes produced partial or failed detonations. Then the rifled tubes began to speak. The first rifled shot struck dead center and penetrated 7.2 inches, the second 7.4, the third 6.9 numbers that clustered where smoothbore results had scattered. By shot 15, a rifled round punched clean through 8 inches of rolled homogeneous armor, the equivalent of heavy frontal protection, and molten metal sprayed into the test bunker's observation slit 300 yards away. The downrange crew measured clay penetration as well, confirming true defeat of the plate. Where the smoothbore group had averaged about 3.9 inches of penetration and missed some shots entirely, the rifled group averaged about 7.7 .7 inches with not a single miss at 50 yards. Statistically, hit probability at that critical range went from roughly 73% for smooth bore down to a 15%. Effective probability of defeating 80 mm per frontal. Armor when accounting for misses and penetration failures. For rifled tubes, the effective probability surged to roughly 97%. In plain terms, a soldier with a rifled bazooka could reliably kill the most common German tank he'd face. With a smooth bore, he was effectively suicidal. 
The Aberdeen numbers were devastating and immediate in their operational consequences. Barnes convened a short, consequential meeting. Retrofit what could be retrofitted, produce rifled tubes going forward, and develop field kits to modify deployed weapons. Converting a tube required industrial rifling machines and roughly eight minutes of machine time per tube. With three factories running, stateside inventory could be converted in weeks. The logistics reality was messy. Some 14,000 M1s had been built, many already shipped. But Barnes decided to rifle everything in stateside stock immediately, begin producing rifled tubes, and issue modification kits where practical. The first rifled bazookas reached combat units in spring 1943 in time for the Tunisia campaign. Those early M1A1 rifled launchers and later the improved two-piece M9 with built-in rifling made a strategic difference in the Mediterranean and, later, in Italy and Normandy. After action reports filtered up in ways the Aberdeen tests had promised, a bazooka team at 70 yards could achieve a first-shot kill on a Panzer before. Infantry units at Salerno and Anzio used rifled launchers to blunt German counterattacks and to deal with heavy tanks when side or rear shots were available. On D-Day, every American company at Utah and Omaha carried bazooka teams whose weapons proved versatile not only against armor, but against concrete fortifications where the shaped charge could penetrate gun emplacements. The consistency changed doctrine. Where once rocket launchers were experimental, unreliable curiosities, after Aberdeen, they became central tools in infantry anti-armor tactics. Portable, immediate, and reliable in the kind of close engagements that defined Mediterranean and European fighting. Across campaigns from Normandy to the Ardennes, bazooka teams racked up confirmed tank kills that official tallies undercredited because tank destroyers and Shermans often received the formal recognition. Infantry memoirs and after-action reports show bazooka teams breaking ambushes, knocking out panthers and tigers from flanks and rear decks, and in one siege at Bastogne, employing M9s to destroy a remarkable number of German armored vehicles. The technological lesson was simple and enduring. Spin stabilizes, and in the case of shaped charges, spin preserves the nose-first orientation that allows the shaped charge jet to form perpendicular to armor and deliver maximum penetration. Mohop's idea, mocked as reckless at first, became foundational. Post-war, that principle carried forward through successive generations of infantry anti-armor weapons. The larger, rifled 3.5-inch and later 3.5 in M20, Super Bazooka, the disposable pre-rifled law, wire-guided systems whose launchers imparted initial stability to guided missiles. And even modern recoilless rifles and shoulder-launched weapons that borrow the same physics. The long arc from a scrap metal pipe in a Maryland workshop to the numerous rifle-stabilized launchers that followed illustrates how a single engineering insight, coupled to decisive testing under realistic conditions, can reorder battlefield effectiveness. Henry Mohop himself remained obscure, a Swiss engineer whose obituary quietly noted early work on shaped charges, but not the Aberdeen test that reshaped infantry anti-armor doctrine. While Captain Skinner and others received military, commendations and ordnance, bureaucracies claimed institutional credit. Yet every infantryman who carried a rifled launcher through Europe, Korea, Vietnam, and beyond benefited from that cold January test. Make the rocket spin, and it goes where you point it. Fail to do so, and brave soldiers keep paying a price for weapons that were accurate in theory, but useless in practice.